Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. I have a fantastic guest for you today. Uh, former martial arts champion, movie star, some of the greatest movies of, of all time, Tron O'Brien's, uh, King of the Kickboxers, uh, Mortal Kombat, and Mr. Keith Cook. Thank you for coming, Keith. Hey, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. It's really appreciated. It's Keith, you've um, yeah, got a long list of films you've been in, many, many movies. I uh, always watched them as a kid growing up to watch you. That's what got me interested in martial arts is watching these movies. <laughs> um, can I just start, Keith, with a little bit of your background, sort of uh, where you was born and where you grew up, etc. I was born in Seattle, Washington. <coughs> um, my, my heritage is actually, I'm half Japanese and half, mostly half Scottish. My father was born in the United States, but his parents were immigrants from Japan and uh, they were farmers. And uh, so my dad kind of grew up on a farm in, in the Seattle area. And um, yeah, my mom, uh, my mom is a Fulton from Scotland. And so I'm half. And so uh, I don't know if that has anything to do with me getting into the martial arts. I mean, I think I was interested in it. You know, I think, uh, you know, my father was supportive of it because, you know, it was an Asian martial arts and he had done Aikido as a kid a little bit. And he was just a lover of the arts. But I had um, encountered some bullies along the way and I saw Bruce Lee and I was just like, oh, my God, I got to do this because I want to be just like him because nobody will ever mess with me. And so I think a lot of people have that story or you know a lot of people were inspired by bruce lee and and he continues to this day to be a huge inspiration to to yeah. people and that's what it was for me and um and so i think that's that's also why you see a lot of martial artists wanting to get into the movies because that was a, one of the main ways that people found out about martial arts was was through the movies and so, you know, I was going to become a professional kickboxer and I was, you know, I competed a lot around the world, but then I started to get opportunities in the movie. So I kind of got sidetracked into that, but I, I love the martial arts and I did, I opened up a martial arts school in Los Angeles in 1994 and we just closed during COVID. We were, were up and running for 28 years. That's a shame to lose it after all them years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it started to get, you know, a little bit, um, you know, because I feel a huge commitment to it. In fact, that that's one of the reasons why I started doing less movies and stuff. I was really into that. And also raising my son who was really into baseball and I got into coaching his teams and uh, I wanted to really wanted to be a part of it. And also the, the progress of the students at the martial arts school was very, very important to me. And so, um, you know, it took up a lot of time. It tends to sort of take you over because it feels like such a, a worthy, you know, endeavor, you know? So, um, I really, I really got into it and I still teach, even though I don't have a brick and mortar place anymore. I teach in my backyard. I have a little studio set up there and, I also teach online now, which I got used to during COVID. And so it's another sort of skill I acquired and I'm still developing that skill because like I told you, I'm sort of a tech idiot, I guess you could say. And so I'm, I'm learning something every day and I'm pr pretty comfortable doing Zooms now. 
I've learned how to demonstrate things on a Zoom so people can interpret them and uh, uh, give feedback in Zooms. And um, and so uh, I still really enjoy teaching. Um, and I teach, I teach kids in person. And I also do some personal training um, for uh, police officers and um, seniors. You know, I'm sort of moving, shifting into wellness a little bit now. And uh, I got an opportunity to do wellness boot camps for police officers that have been through, uh, that have PTSD. And so I've been working with them, which is kind of a dream of mine because I, I trained when I moved down to Los Angeles, I had a really good place to train in, in, in uh, up in Seattle at the University of Washington. There was a boxing there was a boxing gym at the University of Washington in the Intramural Sports Building, and there was a boxing club there. And so I was president of that boxing club for four years. And all these uh, kickboxing champions used to come in there, like Marie Smith, who eventually became the UFC heavyweight champion. So I used to get my butt kicked by him all the time. And uh, uh, a guy named Victor Solier came in there and um, he became, I think, WKA world champion at a lighter weight. And I had some great sparring matches with that guy. Um, but it was, it was kind of like it was a really great place. And every Friday night was just sort of like open night. And we just have sparring and they had a boxing ring, heavy bags, they had a speed bag room. And so that was when I moved down here, I didn't really have anyone to train with at first. So I was training on my own and then meeting up with people at tournaments and stuff like that. And then Arlene Lemus, I don't know if you know who that is. She, she won the gold medal in the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul, Korea in Taekwondo. And she ended up becoming a teammate of mine later on. And she recommended this guy named Steve Fisher, who is a student of Mike Stone. And um, uh, that was it. I, I started going down there. And, and that's when the reason I thought of this story is because he trained a lot of police officers, a lot of police officers trained there. And, um, and so I got to know them and, spar with them, work out with them. And I enjoyed it so much that there's something about, I, I know somebody who makes that, that choice, you know, of service and, and they are also helping keep people safe, you know, that, you know, I think it puts them into a certain, you know, state of mind or a certain approach to life. And I just found it great to be around them. And, and so I was always hoping I would get a chance to, to do that again. And, uh, and so now I have this opportunity training these police officers and we're mostly, we're doing fitness, but, um, cause I'm, I'm also, I do, uh, these, this, I have this fitness product that I invented through years and years of using bands, resistance bands to train at my studio, because I didn't want to put a whole bunch of weight equipment in there that took up a lot of space and stuff like that. So I got really into using bands and um, there used to be this program that was put on by Jim Graydon, who was a, a former uh, Waco world champion kickboxer from the U S and he developed a program called the ultimate body shaping course where you do one day of kickboxing and the next day you do resistance training with bands. And I learned that whole program, and then I, I decided I wanted something that connected to myself, but you didn't, you know, you weren't using these different tubes and having to step on them and stuff like that. And so this one, you can actually do footwork with it, you can kick with it on because the tubes attach to your feet with straps, and it's all really great quality. And so I trained these police officers down on the Santa Monica Bluffs overlooking the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, right at the beach. And it's so awesome. You know, it's such a, a great setting to do a workout and to just uh, sort of take in nature at the same time that you're working out. It's just, it's wonderful. Can I just roll you back? So what age did you very first start training? And you've done a sort of a mix of styles. What was your first sort of style you've done? Okay. Um, when, uh, like I said, I was a Bruce Lee fan. So I, I really wanted to take Kung Fu when it started. I had received a book on karate and I was already 
trying to learn it. And I didn't even really know what the difference was between karate and Kung Fu back then, but I knew about the David Carradine series because I started in 1973. And I think I was just about to turn 13. And that was fairly young in most martial arts studios back then that I knew of. It was more of an adult thing than a kid thing because it was before the Karate Kid. It was before Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It was before Power Rangers. And that's when kids starting to get in and parents started to look for ways of their kids to learn discipline and stuff like that. I wanted to learn self-defense. I wanted to, you know, like get myself tougher, you know, so I could deal with bullies and stuff like that, you know? And so, yeah, I was about, I was almost 13 when I started. And that was like the traditional Kung Fu or? Like well, it wasn't, it wasn't really because um, my instructor was actually born in, uh, he, he, he was born in Shanghai in mainland China. And he was brought up studying. A lot of times they, uh, they would, um, if, if a kid showed athletic, you know, uh, potential, they would give them opportunities to play sports and he chose wushu. And so, but it was a little more traditional back then. It wasn't the modern wushu that we think of now that Jet Li did and stuff like that, but it's, it was a little more traditional and the style that he learned was Northern, like Northern Shaolin. And so anyway, he he brought that with him when his family moved to Hong Kong. And then he I think he studied some more Kung Fu in Hong Kong. And then his family moved to Thailand. And I would think he would study Muay Thai because he went to Thailand, but he studied Taekwondo in in Thailand. And um, which I think was popular there because it was, you know, was, uh, you know, the kicking was I think people saw a similarity between the kicking and Taekwondo and Muay Thai and and it was something that had belts and you could you know and you could pursue and he got his black belt there in Taekwondo so from the beginning when I joined that school uh, it was sort of there was a little bit of a mix of martial arts and I started learning that Taekwondo kicking and he alternated days of teaching Taekwondo and Kung Fu. And I used to go every day. So, because I, but I mainly was interested in the Kung Fu, you know? Um, and I don't think it turns out that that made much of a difference to tell you the truth. I think, you know, as you, as you stay involved in the martial arts for years and years, you, you, you have your, your things that, you know, sort of fit you and you, you keep developing those things. And that's why I think maybe that's why Bruce Lee said there's no such thing as style or, you know, it's more, it's more like you find what's useful and embrace it and throw away what's not useful. And um, so. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I do a mixture of different martial arts and uh, like you say, you take what works for you and what don't you sort of just put on the back burner, don't you? I don't know if you heard of uh, Chuck Merriman. Um, he was a U.S. national coach for uh, for uh, karate. You know, like like the traditional Japanese competitions. Uh, like he coached teams at the uh, Pan Am Games and stuff. And he, uh, when Toki Hill was a world champion, uh, Japanese karate style. And he was, he was saying that, you know, there's a lot of, I, I'd never had it put this way to me, but I found it uh, to be very true is that, you know, when you're dealing in martial arts, especially like Kung Fu and karate, there's a lot of fit theory involved where, you know, if you would do this and I did this, you know, you'd get your uh, throat torn open or, or something like that. Whereas boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, Judo, things like that. It's real, you know, like I grab you, I throw you down, I get on top of you and pound you. It's, it's real. And boxing is like that too. And um, I found myself early on in my training sort of feeling really uh, uncomfortable when I got in close with someone like, <laughs> you know, couldn't see what was going on, you know, felt a little panicky. And that's why I knew I had to get into boxing. I knew I, I needed that 
in close training. And so I spent years and years, uh, many broken noses in boxing. And uh, I, I still love it to this day. I, I love the, I don't know, the learning to watch, you know, like when you see a really beautiful boxer standing in there really close with someone, someone sort of tremendously strong, fast punches at them and they're able to make a miss and pay attention in every moment. And even when they get hit, they're right there. You know, that present moment awareness that I think is so important in martial arts. And it's hard to learn that without the actual, you know, the, the, the reality factor. And so I think, you know, if you don't have that reality and practice it, you very likely will get short circuited pretty quickly in a, in a, sit, a real situation. Yeah, I, I had a similar situation myself. So I started with karate when I was a kid. Uh, I used to fight in semi-contact competition. Yeah. And the same thing. It was sort of uh, long distance fighting, point scoring. Yeah. And a friend of mine was doing kickboxing. And when I started going to kickboxing, I sort of got my ass kicked a little bit hard. Yeah. And, uh, I wasn't used to being hooked, wasn't used to being uppercutted. Yeah. I just wasn't used to the full contact. But, um, you know, I made the switch from that. So... Yeah, definitely a difference in it. I was naive enough to think I was a fighter, you know, yeah. when I was doing point karate and stuff. And, yeah. and, and, and and listen, I'm not putting down that. A lot of those guys can really fight. You know, a lot of those guys can really fight. But uh, but there's a good portion of them who can't. You know, they, they don't they don't think of it that way. They think of it as a sport and it becomes like a tag game or something like that, you know. And um, so anyway. I, I agree with that. Like in reality, to like if it's using its defence for the street, a lot of it, you know, doesn't work, does it? Yeah. And, and by the way, in, in point karate tournaments, I had fights where the guy was trying to take my head off, and then you have the guys who are just trying to, you know, point you with a back fist, you know. And so, uh, you know, I got a lot of good experience. I mean, I went to a lot, a lot of tournaments, and so it was just a, a lot of experience and I, I thank god for those guys who tried to take my head off because you know you really learn something you know and so it's kind of cool okay can i just go into a little bit of your martial arts obviously you also done um weapons and you was obviously a world champion as well in um, yeah. martial arts um, you, know, that, you know you know that thing of of thinking you're a fighter and when I, I went to China, my instructor started taking groups of people to China to train in Wushu back around 1980. And I went with one of the first groups. I really wanted to go. I had seen these Wushu guys. I had seen uh, Jet Li perform when he came to the United States. I think it was 1974 or something like that or 76. And I had seen that. And I thought these guys were just amazing, you know. And so I thought they would be tremendous fighters. And then you get there and you find out they don't even fight. They just train okay. in, in the form. Most of them, now they do. Now they have the Sanda, the Sancho, Sanchu. Have you heard of that? But it's like Chinese kickboxing competition. It's full contact. It's, there's takedowns, but there's no ground and pound. And, and there's leg kicks and, you know, knockouts. And there's some really good fighters that get developed in there now. But um, back then, there was very few people doing that Sanshu or Sanda. Um, uh, you, you remember Gung Li, the yep. fighter? He was from that. He, he came up through, they called it back then Sanshu or Sancho. And, and now they call it Sanda. And uh, he came up through that before he went into MMA and, and kickboxing. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I was surprised, you know, to to realize that they didn't uh, fight, but still I learned a lot there. And, I, and one of the things I studied was weapons there. Like I did this, the broadsword, the double broadsword, the three-sectional staff, and the long staff, which is what I used at the World Walker World Championships in 1987. And I, I won the world championships there with that long staff. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, how did they treat you in China? Did they sort of accept you over there quite, quite well? well you know, oddly enough, we went to the the city, uh, Nanjing, which they used to call Nanking. And uh, that is where some horrible things happened during the Japanese occupation 
you know, around the time of the Second World War, they murdered and pillaged and just, it was not good. And, um, and I think a lot of the older people haven't forgotten, you know, or, or when I was there, this was, this was 45 years ago. I mean, so, uh, you know, but I was very well, I mean, I, I was, I was treated very well, you know, and, um, it was a, it was, it was a great experience because remember, remember when, you know, like, um, Russia and China started dominating gymnastics and diving and in the Olympic games. Well, I got to see how those people train, you know, because the, the martial arts athletes in China train just like that. Each province has their team that competes in the national championships. And Nanjing is in a province called Jiangsu. And they, they, uh, they had a team and we trained with their national team and they trained six hours a day, six days a week. They had Sundays off and we trained, we went in there and just integrated in with the team and trained with their, their team. And so it was a great experience for me because I got to see how professional athletes might train in a communist country. And it's all, you know, they don't have any choice in the matter. They, they have to do what they do. And um, when I say six hours a day, six days a week, there's a, you know, a three hour training session. They go to lunch, take a nap, and then they go back and have another three hour training session, but they're not, training the whole three hours they're learning stuff they're uh like if the coach thinks they have to work on something they'll be over there working on it on, on themselves but but let me tell you it was a wake-up call for me you know on you know what what you really need to do and i couldn't train like that in, in the states because you know we have to work we have to go to school we have to do other things we have our families and stuff like that and so so I had to find ways of training on my own <clears throat> to sort of match the time that they put in. And so I would, I would train in the mornings and in the evenings on my own. And it would be more likely that I would have somebody train with me to train with in the evening. But usually in the mornings, I just trained by myself very early before I went to school or work. I would go to that intramural sports building in, at the University of Washington and train there and just go to an open gym that there was nobody in there that time in the morning. So I just had the whole place to myself. And that's where I would practice my weapons. I would go through, uh, you know, I wanted to have like, you know, four or five forms that were competition ready. And so I would do that. And then before I left, I'd go into the boxing room and hit the bag and do some rounds, you know, and, uh, and then go to work or school, you know, so. Um, good good self-discipline there to do that every day on your own. Yeah, yeah. And um I think I think I learned it by from going to China, you know, that that you know I wanted to do this, this was my choice, and I wanted I didn't want to get my butt kicked because I wasn't willing to put in the work, you know. And so I wanted to make sure I was working at least as hard or more than everybody else out there. So yeah. Okay, so how did you find when you very first started training martial arts? How did you find like the sort of it's like a that sort of military sort of regime, isn't it? Like with um, etiquette and and discipline. Yeah. Um, how did you find that? I had uh, my instructor um, was very tough on us to the point where you know sometimes he was a little abusive, like. I can't even repeat the language, the names he would call you and stuff like that. If he thought you weren't learning fast enough or trying hard enough or something. Um, I think that was good for me in some ways, but a lot of times I had to just squash it down too. And, and so um, I think there's, I think discipline is one thing and, and helping people get tough through encouragement and leadership is very important and there are plenty of martial arts schools like that i think out there and plenty of military and police officers who are trained by officers who understand that you know and coaches in sports you know you got to be tough and you've got to have high expectations of the people you work with um but you also have to have a mutual respect you know and so you know i think it's it's 
important, especially for kids. I've learned that when you get a brand new student in your school, they haven't even decided that if they can do this or not yet, you know, and if you're like berating them and getting down on them, if they don't have a really strong commitment, they're going to quit, you know? And, and so, uh, I learned that children, if you're going to work with children, I think you should, uh, learn how to encourage them. And June Ray, Master, Grandmaster June Ray, Jeff Smith's instructor, John Chung, Chung's uncle, Helen Chung's uncle. They're like, that's like American martial arts royalty. He, he had this term, he called it the PCPs, praise, correct, praise. He said, you have to, you have to, you have to praise a lot. He says, but you also have to correct a lot. So anytime you make a correction on someone, hey, Hey, get that knee up a little bit more. That's it. You know, so you, you make a correction, then you give them a craze. You're doing it. Good job. You know, and then you can end with the, the correction again. Just keep that knee up, you know, or something like that, you know, but it's very encouraging, motivating. Oh, maybe I can do this. It helps a, somebody who's on the fence decide that they can participate in this, even if it's tough and it's, I have to be tough. I'm going to get sweaty. I'm going to get bruised up. I'm going to get smacked around. But, you know, I, I believe it because I had this leader who believed in me, you know. So, Keith, can I just ask you a little bit about your competition side? So, was it, um, did you fight in competition as well as the weapons and forms? Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I was going to become a uh, professional kickboxer. I had three kickboxing matches, um, which I won all three of them. But, you know, I didn't beat, fight anybody ranked or anything like that. And, in fact, a lot of times you would – back then, um, kickboxing was pretty new to the Seattle area. And so when, when you know, like a lot of times – the person would show up or whatever, and they wouldn't pass the physical. And he'd go, oh, we have this other guy who you can fight. And he's, he's sorry, he's 20 pounds heavier, but, you know, are you okay with it? You know, it's kind of like that, you know. And, uh, and so, but I wanted to learn. And so I, you know, this was when I was um, participating in the boxing club. And, uh, and so I was doing a lot of boxing and kickboxing on my own anyway. Um, but like I said, I started getting those opportunities, but I did, uh, I did dabble in it. And then I also fought in the, the AAU Taekwondo where it's full contact, but you don't punch. I mean, you don't punch to the face. And by the way, they don't give you any p points for punching. <laughs> I, I punched a lot of these guys, you know, um, the first time I did it, I won the lightweight division and I punched a lot but I didn't realize I wasn't getting punches points for the punches until later on. And, um, but, uh, I, I love that experience too. And, and being involved with Taekwondo is awesome because, you know, this is one of the things I want to say is like the Taekwondo and the Wushu, even though boxing, um, you know, rhythm is so important in boxing. I felt like Taekwondo style of kicking rhythm, developing rhythm, and wushu with the jumping, you need to develop rhythm. And actually with boxing, you need rhythm too. But for some reason with the kicking, I learned it through Taekwondo and wushu. And it really helped my kicking, you know. And, um, and I was able to see other people and learn from watching them and stuff like that. And just, it's really cool. So, yeah. and then I fought, I mean, I fought a lot of point karate. I got rated actually in fighting before I got rated in forms. Most people don't know that, but I fought a lot of tournaments, you know, uh, in point karate. Yeah. What What would be your preference of choice back then to compete in the uh, the fighting or more of the forms stuff? Well, I, when I, when I started off, I I compete. I used to go to just. I did well when I was in junior division. When I was a teenager, I was doing forms and fighting and then later on i kind of lost interest in forms and after i got my black belt i started just competing in fighting for a period of a few years and then when i went to china i started doing forms again i got real interested in doing forms again and i could see the value for filmmaking that forms has because it has that performance value and you're not only thinking about well for me when i did a form 
I wanted always to communicate power and, um, and uh, speed and things of that nature, you know, but, but I, I think for things to look good, you know, to have an aesthetic value is important for film, you know, to have a sense of, okay, what is this going to look like, you know, to the judges or to people viewing the movie, you know? And so I think a uh, forms competition helped me develop that, that able to sort of visualize what this was going to look like when I did something and wanting to make it look good or communicate strength and power in, in speed and what I was doing. Keith, can I just sort of ask about your grades through your martial arts as well, please? Yeah. I got up to a fifth degree black belt with that, my original instructor. And unfortunately he's passed away. And so I've never, I never pursued more. Um, I was going to do it. I, I started thinking about it with uh, master Steve Fisher, um, Mike Stone student. He would talk to me about it now and again, because he used to come and teach at my school twice a month. And he had that place that I trained with, with the police officers. And, um, and so he sort of, he became my coach and my mentor and um, in the later years. And unfortunately he has passed away too. And um, I really miss him because we were very close. And, um, but uh, yeah, so I haven't really pursued it um, for years, you know, but I still keep up my self-discipline. I train, I, because one of the things that I, I saw regrettably through my years is, is instructors who kind of let themselves go like their own practice and they're teaching people, they're still helping people and stuff. But, you know, like, like I heard that, that Rob, Rob Kamen passed away in his sleep, you know? Um, and I, I, I just think there's, it's really important to keep your, your personal, you know, discipline, self-discipline with uh, workouts and your martial arts skills. If you're teaching to, to, you know, keep it reasonably tuned up, you know? And so that's, that's been a big motivating factor to me. And so, yeah, I, I'm re that's really important to me. And uh, I'm don't really pursue degrees on my belt anymore, but I'm, I'm still, trying to learn and help others, you know? Yeah, I agree with you there with the, um, like keeping active and training as you get older. Like uh, we have Bill Superfoot Wallace come over every year and does seminars. And, you know, he's in his 70s. I think he's 70s. Oh, who's that? Bill Wallace? Bill Superfoot Wallace, yeah. yeah. He comes over and does seminars. and um, I know him well. He's, yeah, uh, he's amazing still. He, he's, he, age. he's an amazing he's guy. Kicks and everything. He's, yeah. Uh, and he's really changed, you know, I think the development of, of, of martial arts. I kind of feel like, like if you look at Jean-Claude Van Damme and that kicking, yeah. you know, and you see people who kick like that. I, I did a lot of Bill Wallace training, you know, like where you join hands and you do slow kicks and hook kicks with a partner. And, um, and that was one of the ways I developed my like front leg for fighting and stuff. And he just has some amazing things that he did that really changed martial arts, I think, because, you know, people started to lots of people were able to use his tools and develop really good kicking skills, you know, and it's, it's pretty amazing, you know. So Keith, can I ask you now, how did you get involved into the movies? Uh, well, I had that goal. Um, my original martial arts instructor, Roger Tung, the, the guy who had the Taekwondo Kung Fu school in Seattle, had moved down to, uh, you know, during those years where I was doing a lot of fighting training and not, not very much forms, he had moved down to Los Angeles and he was like, I know you want to get in the movies. Why don't you move down here and you can teach at my school for a job, you know, while you pursue that. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a pretty good idea. So I moved down and I started teaching and running his school because he was, you know, he was trying to build up a 
exchange business with China, you know, because he, you know, spoke fluent Chinese. He he had relationships with people over there. So he was trying to do importing stuff from China. Plus he was trying to do those, you know, take tours of people to train in martial arts over there. And so he was out of town a lot. So I ran the school and, and started uh, being an extra on things. And I started taking acting classes at the same place where Ernie Reyes Jr. and Ernie Reyes Sr. Uh, took acting lessons in uh, Hollywood. Um, and uh, stayed there training. And I, they used to teach uh, martial arts at that studio. Be, as it's kind of a lot of acting places have a movement, you know, they have stage fighting or they have uh, yoga or Tai Chi or dance or something like that. And this guy decided to have martial arts with, because Ernie was going there. And so they traded their tuition at the acting school for teaching martial arts there. And then they left because he got sidekicks and, um, you know, he was just working a lot, but they couldn't do it anymore. So I took over and I started teaching there and I did trade off. I was there for like six years, you know, and um, it's kind of like, you know, acting is kind of like uh, martial arts in that when you start taking lessons, you, you become a worse fighter at first you know, for a while because you think you know something and it's only enough to make it dangerous for yourself. <laughs> Same thing is true of acting. <laughs> <laughs> so what was your sort of um sort of big break into the was it more you got pulled in by the acting side or from the skills of your martial arts? Um well, you know, like I really didn't want to get thrown in the bin with the other actors because you have these guys who, you know, grew up acting from when they were, you know, their their parents are actors or their parents run a, you know, a an acting studio or, you know, like, like, like uh, Ben Affleck's mom is a, is a acting teacher, you know, and those are the people that you're competing with, you know, uh, sons and daughters of actors and, and producers and directors and stuff like that, that are now be going into the business and, uh, and kids who got in the drama club when they were all the way from grade school up, you know, and so there's a lot of people there who are already good, solid actors that are practicing these acting classes. And I always felt like a novice in there who was trying to learn to express my, you know, emotions and stuff where they needed to be. And, and really for me, I think it was just like living more of life, you know, to, in order to get more comfortable with acting on film and, you know, being comfortable with who you are. So you're, you're not thinking of your lines so much, but you're thinking of the situation that you're in or, you know, in, in acting and, and so it's, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, but still, I felt like my only way to get in was going to be through martial arts, you know. And the first job I got was a, um, was a Gatorade commercial with, uh, that's how I got into the Screen Actors Guild Union. And I went to a huge shadow call of martial artists and auditioned with, and Ernie Ray, Reyes Sr., was there and the two of us got the commercial and did the commercial together and it played during the you know the world series here the baseball so you know like back then this was this this was 1986 i think or 85 86 and i made like fifteen thousand dollars off that that commercial plus i got into the union so that was a pretty good start but the big break came for me was china o'brien and i was just sitting at home i just got done from a workout and I still had my Kung Fu pants on <laughs> and, the phone rings, and I pick it up and, and uh, it was Fred Weintraub, the producer of enter the dragon who produced uh, China O'Brien. He says, Hey Keith, this is Fred Weintraub. And I was, I knew who Fred Weintraub was, you know, because I was a huge Bruce Lee fan. I had no idea he was making a movie with Cynthia Rothrock though. And he went in to tell me about it. And at first I didn't believe it was him. I thought somebody was, you know, pulling my leg or something. And then he convinced me it was him. And he says, uh, so I want you to come over right now. I want to interview you. And I lived in West LA and his office was in West LA. He lived like 10 minutes away from me. And he says, come on over. I said, well, I, I just worked out. I'll take a shower. He goes, no, come over right now. 
And so he didn't want me to like change or anything. He wanted to like see me how I am, you know? And so uh, anyway, so I went straight over there. And so within 10 minutes, I was in his office and being interviewed by him and his daughter, Sandy.